this better this better be good yeah <laughs> uh well i was doing a, a story last week on prayer uh, on the disciples prayer and so i was uh praying about you know uh, the story for today and uh the the lord was telling me to do another story on prayer and i was like oh awesome and i was thinking of all these cool passages on prayer and none of them was what the Lord had me do. Uh, this is actually one of the more difficult stories I've ever tried to learn. Uh, and uh, so, and I, and I always enjoy those challenges, you know, the things that the Lord uh, is, uh, it, it, when, when he speaks to us about something that kind of outside of our zone. So our story today is about a guy named Nehemiah. And uh, before this, uh, the nation of Israel had divided into the nation of Israel and Judah and Israel just went south in a hurry. I mean, they just immediately went off the rails and stopped following the Lord. Uh, all their kings after the split were bad kings. Uh, Judah was a little bit more faithful for a little bit longer, but it didn't take too much uh, longer before God judged them. Uh, and God had told Moses in uh, you know one of one of the pen, books of the Pentateuch that if the children of Israel sinned, he was going to discipline them by taking them out of the Holy Land. Uh, but there was always hope because if they repented, he would bring them back. And uh, so just prior to this, about 100 years before, the first group of Jews went back to Israel under a guy named Zerubbabel. And about 15 years or so before this, another guy named Ezra, who has a book in the Bible named after him, uh, he went back with about 2,000 people. So the first group was 50,000. This group's about 2,000. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they had been there for, for a little bit, you know, to rebuild Jerusalem. And uh, uh, there's a guy named Hanani who is referred to as Nehemiah's brother. Now, we're not sure if he is the actual physical brother, but for indications are they did have some kind of relationship uh and hanani had gone back to jerusalem and he had come to shushan uh, in persia where nehemiah was serving the king as a cupbearer and uh and, and nehemiah said hey man how's it going at the rebuilding of jerusalem and he said man it's terrible the walls aren't rebuilt. The gates have been burned. The people are just uh, despondent. Everything is horrible. And that leads us to our story from God's word. When I heard these words, I sat down and, and, and I wept. And, and I mourned for many days. And, and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And, and, and I said, Lord, I pray, uh, I, I pray you great and awesome God who, who hears, who, who, who hears though, who keeps his covenant and his mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments. May your ear be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant. That I pray day and night for your servants, the children of Israel. We've sinned against you. My father's house and I, we have sinned against you because we have despised the commandment of your servant Moses, despised the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances of your servant Moses. But remember the commandment you gave to Moses. If my people reject me, and rebel against me, I will send them, scatter them among the nations. But 
if they return to me, even if they have been scattered to the far horizons, I will gather them to the place where I've chosen for my name to dwell. And that is our story from God's word. And so Stacy, I am, or Susan, I am looking at you. Is I, am, am I? Yeah, it was, it was, it was good. There was a couple of things that were left out. Okay. Um, one of them was, and I don't know, you mentioned you were doing, one of them was, um, let's see. Um, I don't believe you said in verse five, I, I pray, Lord God of heaven. I think Lord God of heaven wasn't okay. in there. Okay, all right. Um, okay. But okay. I don't know if that's important or not. Thank you, thank you. I, all, all of it's important, so we want to be accurate. So, right. uh, does somebody want to try to read? And by the way, I have forty minutes because I've assigned that to myself. I should have told, uh, should have told my my coaches that. Sorry about that. Uh, would somebody like to try to? This is a hard, hard story. Uh, I've been working on this story for a week and, and still just now getting comfortable with it. So if you don't know it personally, that's okay. But it will still help us, even if you get some of the parts down. From the part where he said, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for many days. Uh, somebody like to try to retell what you can remember from there? I'll try. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, so I mourned and I fasted for many days and cried out to the Lord. Um, wow. <laughs> um, and I I said to the Lord we have not kept your commandments your ordinances or your statutes very good we we have sinned against you uh, me and my father's household and the nation and you you told us that if we would not be faithful to you, that we would not be in this land. But if we would be faithful, you would return us. That's sorry. Very good. Oh, that's awesome. You got you got okay. the pretty much the whole outline of what what he's doing because everything in each section builds on the things that you brought up and you got all three specifically of the commandment statues and ordinances uh that your servant moses gave us so that's really good so now i want to get you guys to help me uh retell this story and and so you want to turn your your mics on uh, and uh and that's one of the things when you're doing stories online, you want to remind people to do because uh, typically we'll turn our mics off, right? Uh, but so he starts off, he says, when I heard these words, what did he do? Sat down. Yeah, he, he sat down and prayed. He I cried, wept. Cried. Cried. And then he mourned for just a little bit. No, many days, many, many, days. Days. many days, and he also did so as he was mourning, he was fasting and praying, fasting and praying before the God of heaven, the God of heaven. And then he said, I pray, O Lord God, God, God of heaven. Yeah. Uh, and, and then he uses mm -hmm. a title, Great and Awesome, 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 awesome. awesome. God. Uh, who hears the people that hot, hot. love him, love him, and yeah. obey his what? Yeah, obey his commandments. commandments. He said, "May your 
Yeah, yeah be attentive. Ear be them. attentive and your eyes. eyes be open that your is may hear the prayer of your servant servant who prays day and night. Yeah, who prays day and night for your servants who? Who's he praying for? Have sinned against you. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. The children of Israel, your servants, the children of Israel, who have sinned against you. And then he says, my my father's house. And me. Yeah, and I have sinned against, sinned against you. you. Uh, because we have, and, and I corrupted, I mean, we're, uh, fixed the word, corrupted, and he lists three things that they've corrupted. Commandments, the ordinances, and the statutes. Yeah, your commandments, statutes, and ordinances, which you gave to your servant, whom? Moses. Yeah, to your servant, Moses. And then he said, remember what? The promise, covenant, the command that Come you on. gave to whom? Your Moses, servant, your Moses. servant Moses. Wow. That if you rebel against me, what's going to happen? Scattered. Scattered to where? Scattered. Yeah, to the nation. Yeah. And then there's a huge, yeah. it's only got three letters, but it's an important word. But. But. If you do what? Return to being faithful to me. Yeah, if you return to being faithful to me, even if you've been scattered where? Everywhere. Yeah, to the farthest horizons. I'm going to do what? Bring you back. And put you where? In the land. Yeah, into the place where my spirit dwells. Where my Jesus. name dwells. In the place I have chosen for my Ooh. name to dwell. So, yeah. Uh, and again, a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue there. It's a, it's a hard story to get down yes. uh, yeah. but boy that hopefully we're going to see that there's some treasures uh maybe to be found. Amen. you know I, I wonder what do you think it might have been like to be nehemiah and, and you had these two groups fifty thousand folks and two thousand folks uh that god has supernaturally provided a way for them to go back to jerusalem and rebuild and you know, you're kind of under the assumption that things are going well, and then all of a sudden you hear, not only are they not going well, they're going terribly. What might that have been like emotionally for him? I think it was as distressing from, for him, very distressing for him. Because of what he did. Yeah, because of what we're going to see him do in the, in the story. And what else do you see there? I mean, what, what might have made that worse? Because he hoped something would be different. Mm. He hoped it would all go smoothly and because they're back home. Yeah, maybe they... Disappointment. Keep... Disappointment. That's a good word, Vivian. Yeah, thank you. Desperate. I think desperate. Ooh. Because I mean, I mean, you've got fifty-two thousand people, and no one's done anything. The the there's burning. Maybe there's even fires still going on. Who knows? You know, and it's just bad report all around. And it's just like there's nothing we can do. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We're and I'm helpless. Yeah, helpless, helpless. Yeah. Helpless, yeah. Well, let's look at the very first part of this story. So when I heard his words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days and I prayed and fasted uh, to the God of heaven. 
and I said, I pray, O Lord, God of heaven, uh, you who, uh, who keep your covenant and your mercy with those who love you and keep your commandments. Uh, may your ear be attentive and your eyes be open so that you may hear the prayer of your servant who prays day and night for your servants, the children of Israel. And so let's just stop uh, right there. So, well, we, we see him just, I mean, he gets the news. I mean, how do you picture that playing out as you hear that story? So he gets the news about what's going on in Jerusalem. What, what do you see in your imagination happening then? Yeah, I see Nehemiah going fairly upbeat to see his friend and get a good report and things are going well and we planted crops and we have cattle and we have, you know, the city's going well, we made trade and everything else and he's just shaking his head, Hanny is shaking his head and you, you are so deceived. <laughs> yeah, you got no clue. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, go ahead, Diane. It's harder to imagine a time when communication took so long. Mm. Yeah. So who knows when that last report was. Maybe the last report looked a little more hopeful or something. Mm. Maybe it looked bad, but he's hoping this one would be good. But, you know, you just kind of keep whatever picture you want in your head between reports. And, and so that, I think, makes it, you know, can make it really hard if you've been holding on to a, a better picture mm, yeah for kind of a while that, that contrast makes it worse uh, well the fact that he gets the news and he just collapses right and and starts weeping mm -hmm. uh i mean might that tell us anything about his spiritual concern for his own country what do you see there Coffee, I know you're talking, but I can't hear you. You're you're breaking up. Yeah, if you could just write a message, just write it out, and I'll I'll tell them what you say, Coffee. Does that make sense? Just send a message, and we'll we'll read it here. Well, so does he see this? as a spiritual issue, as a leadership issue. I mean, you know, Ezra had gone back, Zerubbabel had gone back. They could have done something to rebuild these walls. Is he, uh, does he start whining about, man, they need better leadership? I mean, what's, what does he see the problem being based on what He's, we see in this part of the He story? sees the problem that as being that they didn't, I mean, it's later in the story, but they hadn't obeyed what Moses had commanded, mm -hmm. the repentance side. So it's a spirit. He sees it being a spiritual issue yeah. and, and not a leadership issue. I don't know well, that I'm, he knows about the leadership much. Mm, okay. I think, I think he sees it. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Susan. I didn't know you were finished. Were finished. Excuse me. No, no, I'm done. Thank you. You sure? Yeah. Well, well um, I don't. You know, Hananiah didn't mention the leadership or anything. Right. So he may not have known how well or not well they were being led. You know, everything is a spiritual issue in the sense that God will fix every problem you have if he, if he wants to. But he's also concerned about the physical part of it because the, he, he mentions that the gates are burning or have been burned. Right. Walls have not been repaired. It's 52,000 people, which is a considerable sized city without any protection for them. So I think he's concerned about both issues and the economic issue too, uh, because I mean, you need money to do those things. They just don't happen magically. I think there's an all around concern. Okay. That's good. Well, the fact he, he goes to the Lord uh, and, and, and says, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and his mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments, right? So is he, uh, do, we, 
do we, do we see Nehemiah being legalistic here? Like, okay, you guys got to keep those commandments. That's what, that's what matters is obeying the law. Yeah. Clementine. I think Nehemiah have a relationship with God and he can dialogue with him. So this is a time of dialoguing and mourning and praying and asking God his mercy because of that relationship. He know who he's talking to. Mm. So that made a difference. Okay. All right. He knows the God he's addressing. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Susan. I would say that from this, that he has some intimacy with God mm. because he's reminding him of his covenant, but in a, in a very respectful way. But yeah, well, you mentioned the covenant. When we think of covenant, is is that just a do this kind of thing? You know, do this and this will happen. Don't do this and this will happen. I mean, do we? Does that lean? Do, do our minds lean towards legalism? Yeah, Clementine. Do the conversation that we're having? As uh, the, uh, Susan mentioned, intimacy, I don't think it's legalism. Mm, I think that, rather a broken person that know his God, that know that God look at us. We know you are capable of doing this for us. We are just pleading with a, a way of being humble. He's humiliating himself before uh, the Lord and uh, asking for his divine intervention on their behalf. Mm. So I don't think it's legalism. Yeah, and, um, and, you know, it's it's interesting to me because he says he's going to keep the covenant and mercy with those who do what? Love him. Who loves him. And keep his commandment. So, right. I mean, what do we learn there by the fact he puts loving God and obeying the commandments together? I mean, what might that show us about his expectation. Yeah, Diane. I've come to see covenants as more like a family relationship, hmm. like uh, the adult child um, that, uh, that comes home that has the choice to live with the family or live without. And the, and the parents say, if you want to live under my roof, hmm. these are my rules. No, you can't bring that boy you're not married to in here. No, you can't smoke. Yes, you must help with the cleaning and paying of expenses. So there, it's not this legal thing. It's more, this is how our family works. And we love one another. And we, we follow the house rules. Mm, okay. Wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. What is, what's some of the rest of you see there? What do you think about that? I think I think he's reminding God mm -hmm. um, of his promises that that if those who love him and keep his commandments are under his protection. Mm. Now, in a house, like Diane said, there's going to be people that break dishes. I'm sure that's one of the rules you have not to do. Uh, that don't wash the dishes at night. I'm sure that's one of the rules you have. But those things in particular are not going to get you kicked out of the house. Instead, I think it's more the attitude that you have toward those who are over you. And here he's saying that he calls God great and awesome. And he reminds God of his attributes. Oh. And so I think more than anything else, he's reminding God of, of who he is, who God is. And this is how God acts. And you know, then he starts the other parts of his prayer of confession. I haven't kept the house rules. My family hasn't kept the house rules, but you, you keep covenant. Mm. You're, you're, you know, you, you give $5 allowance every week. So. <laughs> <laughs> or could you use that to bail me out of jail right now? <laughs> yeah, Susan. Well, you know, I think that love is, is so important to God and he's just in a respectful way Dang. Reminding him, not just the rules. I think that both, you know, 
if you love the family you're in, then you try and put some effort in, so to speak. And they had not followed. I mean, there were specifics with them because of God's protection yeah. for them. Kofi yeah. writes, Kofi yeah, writes. I, I love what Kofi just added uh, in, in his message uh, that, uh, that, that he, he knows God uh, and he's serving through his prayer. He's remembering God, his promises, his covenants. Yeah, I, I think that's good. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me. He says, and may your ears be attentive and your eyes be open so that you may hear uh, the, the prayer of your servant that he prays day and night for your servants, the children of Israel. Uh, so I wonder there, is this, you know, does he think God's gone deaf? Uh, no. We learn from the way he phrases that. What do you see there? No, I think he's saying, I know you are listening. Okay. I know you're listening. I think he's telling God that what he has to say is pretty important right now. Mm. And um, if you could just give me all your attention. Well, you know, you, you mentioned that, I mean, we, you know, in the very first part of the story, we see he mourned for many days. Uh, we're told someplace else it's in the, in the story, it's a couple of months at least. Uh, and now he's saying he's praying day and night. So what might the intensity of, uh, of, of Nehemiah's prayer, what might that show us about his heart towards this land that he's, you know, he wasn't born in, in the promised land, right? He's, he's born, he's born in Persia. Uh, yeah, I mean, but, but still he's, ooh, it said God, God moved when he hears Nehemiah's words from a prayer. Yeah, that's good. Um, just going back to the family metaphor, which I think is apt here, yeah. is that if someone in the household is, is sad or acting strangely, uh, especially if it's an older person, like a young adult, you might not mention anything until that person is ready to mention it. And so here's Nehemiah fasting, praying, sad, probably ripped his clothes, who knows. Um, and then he's telling God, hey, I'm going to talk to you now. I want to talk about my problem. Mm. I want everyone, I want mom and dad to pay attention because they can do something about it. And so that's, I think, I think that's what he's doing here. He's he saying, I'm going to talk about my problem now. You've seen me sad and not talking because I don't know what to say exactly. But now I know what to say. And so I want you to pay attention. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you bring that up. I wonder the fact he brings up the covenant and God's mercy. I mean, mm. how, how might that add to what Andrew just shared? Is he just saying, God, I hope you're in a good mood today. I've been fasting. I've been praying. Got your attention now. Or is he depending on something other than God's emotions? Susan. Well, knowing God, God, God is always truthful mm. and keeps covenant yeah. and shows mercy. Mm. So he's, mm. he's saying, this is who you are. Mm. Would you indirectly is saying act on it? Yeah. Mm. At yeah. least that's what it sounds to me. Yeah, that's good. Mm. Clementine. Clementine? Mm. Nehemiah, knowing the mercy of God, knowing that he's the only person he can turn to. Mm. He couldn't turn to mm. anybody else. Mm. He could mm -hmm. actually go to the king and plead with the king over there. He could have asked mm. the family to come and pray together. But he took that burden upon himself and seeing who that God is how merciful he is mm. and approach him. He have that mm. confidence. He have that boldness, even though, yeah. So he, he took that upon himself and wanted to stand in 
because God always loved to see at least one person standing in for a nation. Mm. So Nehemiah probably took that upon himself to know that he is the God that can answer, that do not turn back from his word. He always see, watches to so that his word be fulfilled. So you have that trust mm. and confidence wow. to do okay. Yeah, thank you. And Diane, I'll, I'll let you share, uh, have, the, have the last word here before we uh, ah. move to. It, it just occurred to me that maybe because Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king, that covenants, that both the ancient covenants of Israel are very real to him, mm. but also the covenants that he would have seen played out mm. with this powerful um, mm. king that he serves, who would have had subjugated people, but also maybe some agreements with other powerful um, entities or entities nearby. Yeah. Oh, that's then, good. Oh, that's good. You know, we, we, we talked about early in the story uh, mm -hmm. about how, you know, there was a, a physical problem, but Nehemiah saw it, the, saw the root of that as a, as a spiritual issue. And uh, I mean, to today, our, our, our spiritual, our spiritual issues, let me get this out. Uh, do, do they, t are they typically at the root of things that we look around in our lives and, and, and so. we might initially think they're physical problems or economic problems, but the root is spiritual. Is that, is that still true today? You know, what might it look like just in, in general in life today to have, you know, to, to look at something and go, okay, this is what the problem is, but the real issue is deeper than that. I think people not being able to get ahead economically. Mm many times has a spiritual issue. Okay, yeah. People captivated by their cell phones. What is it that they're mm -hmm. trying to deal with that mm -hmm. thing? Wow. Mm -hmm. Addiction, addiction is another good one. Okay, yeah, addiction. Mm -hmm. Anything, uh, yeah, Susan. Just um, loving the world more than God, which is, spiritual but being too entrenched in the things of the world yeah you know here in the states i i think of issues that we have of we we want god and materialism and, and we we see people's neglect of the deeply spiritual things as you know a, a physical thing but oh extreme poverty yeah thank you kofi yeah, we, we look at that as a physical thing, but at its heart, it's it's very often a spiritual issue. I, I wonder for, for you guys, is there are there any things that uh, you know personally you, you've experienced or seen that you know you maybe you or somebody you know thought, wow, this is a physical deal, but then you realize, ooh, oh. Yeah, the whole transgender issue, that's a deeply spiritual problem, right? It's just sad. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think I've been thinking about the low birth rate mm. um, in the US. Yeah. And how there are so many people who prioritize something else over life. Yeah. They they're putting all these other things. And then they look very oddly. I, I know there's some families that go all out and have big families. And I feel like in the church, some of them are making a statement of we affirm life and raising these disciples up. And it's not that everybody should have eight kids, but that there's a spiritual element in deciding when, when people have a choice yeah. to have children or not. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, about four years ago in the country of Japan, they reached a place where they were selling more Depends for elderly people than they were baby diapers. Uh, wow. And it's a, it's a huge issue for the nation, but it gets back to that heart, you know, like Diane was saying, 
uh, of, of a spiritual issue of selfishness and not being willing to sacrifice to, to raise up, uh, you know, somebody else. I, I wonder in this story, just very quickly, is, is, did anything stand out to you in this just first part of this story that might help you in the future in, in your relationship with the Lord? Yeah, Andrew. I think it's very interesting that Nehemiah does not blame poor government mm. for the situation. And uh, that's an easy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, in Austin, Texas today, there's a real problem with homelessness. Yeah. And a few months ago, under every bridge on the interstate and almost every intersection, there were five or six people, five or six tents with people living and the crime rate just out of control and everything else. And and a lot of that is, a lot of those people just got caught, some of those people just got caught up in the economic crisis and COVID and everything else, okay? But I think a lot of the problem is a spiritual problem of the local church and the local communities and simply not responding to the poor, the needy, the helpless, and helping people overcome drug abuse, overcome rebellion, uh, learn how to homeschool if the public school is just beyond evil, uh, learning how to do these things in the local church, not understanding their role in society as we are the salt of the earth to take this, this tremendous opportunity that we have to take these people and help turn them into productive citizens instead of just people living under the bridge, living on handouts, getting in line for the food bank and everything else. And, and that I think is a real spiritual issue um, I know that the government would interfere. Of course, it was going to. It's 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 designed for other things, the government than than that issue, than taking the church's role in society. And so I think that that's a real spiritual issue. Myself is uh, when people look to the government to solve a church-related uh, uh, moral crisis, and not being able to see homelessness and poverty as a moral as a moral issue that the yeah. church is responsible to deal with. Thank you for sharing, Andrew. Uh, well, this story is in Nehemiah chapter 1, and we dealt with verses 4 through 11. Uh, and uh, we, we may deal with this again a little later on this week. But there we go. Let me get my, let me get my seat back down so I can <laughs> sit. Thank you. That was wonderful.